The uh, Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change will now come to order. Uh, I recognize myself for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Our legislative hearing this morning will examine solutions for, uh, to reduce environmental and health risks from para- and polyfluoroalkyl substances, commonly known as PFAS. This hearing builds on good work that began under the leadership of our Republican colleagues last year when they held a hearing to better understand these substances, as well as EPA and DOD's response to the growing number of communities dealing with contaminations. At that hearing, we established that PFAS are a lar are large class of chemicals, numbering between four and 5,000, commonly used in firefighting foams, food packaging, nonstick cookware, and water-resistant fabrics. These chemicals are remarkably persistent in the environment and incredibly toxic and dangerous to human health, even in very small concentrations, equivalent to a few drops in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. We are still learning the full extent of the dangers, but PFAS exposure has already been linked to kidney disease, thyroid dysfunction, and various forms of cancer. Other committees have held hearings on the risks and toxicity of PFAS chemicals. And it is clear that there is considerable interest from members on both sides of the aisle and in both chambers to determine how Congress should proceed in the face of this growing crisis. I know there are many members, including members of this committee, dealing with PFAS contamination back home. Over the past few years, I have had numerous opportunities to meet with families of Hoosick Falls and Petersburg in Rensselaer County, New York, including Ms. Marp, who uh, we will hear from this morning, and her daughter, Gwen. And just last week, I visited the water system and other sites in Horsham, Pennsylvania, learning from and seeing the challenges they have faced firsthand. I know these communities, their local leaders, and their water systems are trying to do everything possible to protect their residents. These contaminations and the resulting harm to public health are not their fault, and it is incumbent upon us to make sure that they have the resources, information, and legal authorities to remediate contaminations to protective levels and to hold polluters accountable even when those polluters are a federal entity. Today's hearing is the first that will examine concrete solutions being offered by our colleagues. We will consider 13 bills that have been referred to the subcommittee. These bills address how we can reduce exposure, expedite cleanups, and dispose of these chemicals safely. While addressing PFAS in drinking water is a top priority of mine, today we will also hear that PFAS exposure concerns uh, go beyond water. These bills range across multiple statutes, including the Safe Drinking Water Act, Superfund, TSCA, and the Clean Air Act. Earlier this year, EPA released its PFAS Action Plan. I do not doubt that the motivations of the administration are good, but there can be no question that the response has been inadequate. First, EPA's plan is not comprehensive. The plan focuses primarily on two chemicals in a class of thousands, PFOA and PFOS. These are certainly the best known PFOS, but a domestic manufacturer of these two seized years ago. Real and ongoing risks for future exposure will come as companies substitute them with other emerging and dangerous substances such as Gen X. Second, EPA has given us little reason for confidence that they will act with the urgency that impacted communities now know is needed. EPA has not even con uh, committed to setting a national drinking water standard, and even on the most aggressive timeline, regulatory action will take years. To be clear, this is as much a criticism of the Safe Drinking Water Act than of this EPA. In the past 22 years, there has been just one contaminant determined to need a national standard. It has been years since that determination, and we are still waiting for it to be finalized. It will likely take many years for PFOA and PFOS to have a finalized, enforceable, and protective standard, should EPA determine that to be their course of action. We need to have a larger conversation about SIDWA, regulatory reform, but that issue cannot stop us from taking action on PFAS. SIDWA's shortcomings are bigger than PFAS, and PFAS issues are bigger than drinking water. We must consider what is needed to be done right now. This is just the beginning of this process. I welcome feedback from any stakeholder or member interested in these or other bills so that we can move forward in a way that best protects our communities from the damage these substances are causing. But one thing is clear, we cannot wait for EPA to act. Congress needs to be actively involved to ensure the protection of Americans' health.
My hope is some com combination of the bills considered today can enable us to make progress to reduce the risks of exposure, increase testing and monitoring, and require as well as provide resources to support remediation. I thank my colleagues for their work on this timely issue as well as our witnesses for sharing their insights and sometimes painful experiences. I look forward to working together to find potential agreement. Um, with that, I'll now recognize the uh, ranking uh, Republican or Republican leader of our subcommittee, uh, Mr. Shimkus. You can call me. Uh, ranking Member Walden is not here, so you can call me Ranking Member Shimkus. That's right. I'm, I'm good with that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that we are meeting to learn more about the bills introduced this, this Congress to tackle various forms of contamination linked to highly fluorinated chemicals known as PFAS for short. Based on a cursory read of all the long titles of the bills introduced and referred to our committee, this Congress, we are looking at a comprehensive set of proposals that range from instituting sweeping mandates in just about every law this subcommittee oversees, authorizing a significant amount of federal money for PFAS-related actions, on top of those programs currently operated by the federal and state governments, and creating labeling programs for consumer products that do not contain PFAS. If you are serious about these proposals becoming law, they need a full and fair airing with a complete legislative history and record. I hope you will, at the very least, commit to us today that you will bring EPA in as part of this hearing. But on another day for questioning uh, on the technical aspects of these bills before the committee schedules any markups on these bills or they are considered on the House floor. Mr. Chairman, this is not a delay tactic. This is a plea to prevent major expensive mandates on states as well as unintended consequences on EPA's ongoing work, both on PFAS and many other substances would have to take a back seat to the mandates in these bills. In addition to our subcommittee's current lack of agency input, I am concerned that almost one-third of our subcommittee's members were not around last fall when this subcommittee held both a member briefing with EPA career staff and an oversight hearing about PFAS, ways the federal government was and could respond under existing laws, and ways to address contamination and appropriately communicate risk. That said, I am sympathetic to my colleagues who commu whose communities want urgent action to address PFAS. I also, though, am not a fan of rushing to install broad-based major changes to federal law at a time when high levels of anxiety exceed what we know. This does not mean quote unquote, do nothing. Rather, I believe we should not make shortcuts in the law while EPA is taking steps based upon solid scientific data to make regulatory decisions. Moreover, if the problem is urgent, the federal government has imminent hazard authority under many of the laws we will talk about today to go in and take immediate action. This view may, this view may not be popular with some of my colleagues, but I believe we cannot only support the use of good science or public input when it guarantees our preferred policy solutions. This was a major principle for me during enactment of the major reforms of the Toxic Substances Control Act. It is striking to me that we are disregarding both these tenants to regulate between three to 5,000 substances by statutory fiat. Moreover, these bills do not give the federal government the ability to prioritize the risk of PFAS versus greater environmental and public health efforts or other currently ongoing work, meaning scarce resources, would need to be moved to meet the mandates in this bill before us at the expense of other items. It may not sound like it, but I may be open to getting yes on some of these proposals. Yet, of the bills for which I have seen text and without getting technical feedback from the agency that needs to implement it, I have too many questions about the wholesale regulation of this large class of chemicals when there are only a handful of these chemicals that we know something about, such as the ability to detect them in water or their causal effects on health. Further, states and the federal government, including the EPA and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, have been taking collaborative and independent action to drive down and properly communicate the risk, and the equipment to detect and treat all these substances is still evolving. Fundamentally, I just need more information about the impact, both positive and negative, that these proposals could have to make sure they are tailored to address established risk without establishing bad precedents for regulatory efforts driven by fear rather than by data. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and hope that they will not be the la this will not be the last word on these bills in committee before they are considered. Um, and let me just, that was the, the uh, prepared statement. Uh, let me just say this, Mr. Chairman. This is a whole class of chemicals that can range from three to 5,000 chemicals. Um, 
we did pass the Toxic Sub Substances Control Act, which was to address using real science and real data to make decisions on health-related chemicals. I think we got to be very careful, as, as with the hearing we had last week, of uh, by legislative fiat banning things which we may or may not know are harmful. Now, I, I, I don't question that there's probably some of the PFAS categories that are harmful. But to threaten the three to 5,000 list of those um, is not in line with the scientific approach that we agreed to under TSCA. And I look forward to having EPA hopefully help us muddle mm -hmm. through this. And this is not a no on these bills. This is, and this is not a delay tactic. This is just give me a little more time appeal. And with that, I yield back. The uh, gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Pallone, chairman of the full committee, for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. PFAS contamination is a very serious issue affecting communities nationwide. There, these are persistent chemicals that spread throughout our water, air, and soil. They're toxic, with studies showing increased cancers, immune impacts, and effects on growth, development, and fertility. And these chemicals are everywhere in our environment, in our bodies, and with new affected communities being discovered all the time. Although chemical companies have known the hazards of these chemicals for many years, we're still realizing the scope of contamination, and it's increasingly clear that we'll need to attack PFAS contamination with every tool we have as quickly as we can. So I want to thank the many members in the House who have introduced legislation to address the PFAS problem, and I wanted to kind of go through that list. Representatives Dingle and Upton have worked together to introduce two important bills to address PFAS contamination through the Superfund program. Representatives Boyle and Fitzpatrick have a bill to set a binding, enforceable, and strong drinking water standard for all PFAS. Representative Soto has introduced a bill to provide industry with a voluntary PFAS-free label for cookware so consumers can take steps to protect themselves from exposure. Representative Delgado introduced a bill to require reporting of PFAS releases on the toxic release inventory. TRI reporting provides an essential tool to communities impacted by environmental pollution and has a strong record of driving polluters to reduce their releases. Representative Khanna has introduced a bill to ban incineration of PFAS waste, including firefighting foam. Incineration has been a serious concern for the local communities where it's happening. Representative Custer introduced a bill to ban new PFAS chemicals under TSCA. There are already 4,700 PFAS chemicals in commerce, and it's astonishing that we continue to approve more of these chemicals given what we know about them. Then we have Representative Dean, who has a bill to comprehensively regulate PFAS under TSCA, including a phased-in ban of new and existing PFAS, standards for safe disposal of PFAS, and labeling for articles containing PFAS. Representative Sean Patrick Maloney has introduced a bill to address PFAS under TSCA also, using EPA's authorities under that law to require health effects testing and reporting on all PFAS chemicals. Representative Stevens has a bill to list all PFAS as hazardous air pollutants under the Clean Air Act. His bill, or that bill, responds to increasing evidence that air emissions of PFAS are dangerous and avoidable. Representative Fletcher has legislation requiring EPA to issue guidance for first responders to minimize the use of PFAS uh, and also uh, deals with firefighting foam and cuts the risks they face from that foam. We heard from the International Association of Firefighters in March about the fear among firefighters about how these chemicals are affecting their health, so we have to address those fears. And then we have Representative Rhoda, who introduced a bill to establish a trust fund financed by user fees from PFAS manufacturers. And these funds will help pay the ongoing operation and maintenance costs of drinking water utilities and water treatment works that are paying to clean up PFAS contamination. And finally, I introduced a bill that providing financial assistance for the Safe Drinking Water Act, and my bill offers significant federal investments to help water utilities pay the capital costs needed to adopt treatment techniques that can remove PFAS from drinking water. And these treatment techniques are very expensive and may be beyond what is affordable for many affected communities. Now, I've mentioned or described 13 bills, obviously very bipartisan effort, uh, more being introduced every day. And I think these bills are all important, and they all address a different aspect of the PFAS problem. Many people think of PFAS as solely a drinking water issue, but all the PFAS in our drinking water came from industrial activity. 
They'll keep showing up in our drinking water sources if we continue to produce and use thousands of different PFAS chemicals. So we need to stop PFAS pollution at the source, contain the pollution before it spreads further, and get it out of our air, soil, and drinking water. And we don't have a lot of time to waste. So I want to I look forward to working together quickly to address PFAS contamination and implement some of the solutions we're going to hear about today. I have whatever time I have left, I'll yield to the gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Dingell. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Chairman Tonko. Today's hearing is obviously important, as we, uh, both of you, have, everybody, both sides, has pointed out. But briefly, I would like to acknowledge that one of the witnesses is from my district, and he serves on the front line to provide clean drinking water to the residents of Ann Arbor, Michigan. But he is a national expert. Brian Steglitz is the manager for water treatment services for the city of Ann Arbor, and this year he marks his 26th second years of service. He helped EPA toward them and showed them the water treatment center with both Mr. Upton and I last summer. This committee can learn a great deal from his experience and all the good work that's being done at the local level, along with the challenges that st we still face to safeguard the public from the PFAS chemicals. So thank you for being here, and I look forward to hearing from all of you and asking more questions later. Yield back. The Congresswoman yields back, the uh, Chairman yields back, and, oh, okay, and we'll uh, now recognize the, um, uh, Mr. Walden, the Republican leader of the full committee for five minutes, his opening statement. Go ahead and ad lib a minute, Mr. Chairman, I'll get my breath. Thank you, I was down at the FCC hearing, so uh, welcome, good morning. I know the experience of uh, your constituency in, uh, Hoosick Falls, New York, has driven your intense interest in preventing and addressing PFAS contamination. Not only have I heard from uh, Republican members like Mr. Upton and Mr. Hudson about the anxiety that uh, discoveries of PFAS contamination have caused their constituents in Michigan and in North Carolina, but I also know the Air National Guard at Kingsley Air Force Base in Klamath Falls um, that they've used this foam with PFAS to fight fires uh, in the uh, congressional district I represent in Oregon. So this is a big issue we're all concerned about. In fact, few of these chemicals are quite prevalent, uh, while some occur in just a few states. Complicating the issue is the limitation of what we know about the very broad class of chemicals and what we can do about it under existing law. So we need to address the concerns about uncertainty that PFAS presents. The test for me in addressing PFAS contamination is not the number of bills we pass or the creative ways we try to shoehorn solutions into existing statutes. Rather, it's whether the response we provide can be reasonable, reliable, and responsible remedial efforts that get help to people sooner rather than later and without detours to the courthouse. This is about public health and public safety. For this reason, I'm not convinced the existing body of environmental law may be the best approach to uh, the PFAS contamination conundrum, and we should not be limited by that universe. We may need to have to think outside the box here. So I think it makes sense to think about addressing this problem within these overarching principles. First, we need to contain the existing damage and fix the demonstrated problem before us. Second, in the process of doing that, do no harm either uh, to existing sites and communities nor exacerbate the existing problem with overreach. And last, we need to learn more about the toxicity of the larger class of chemicals, um, uh, commit resources, and take future steps based on what we know, not just what we suspect. So if I could give you a couple of examples. Where there is merit to the use of Superfund authority to make federal funds available, as well as compel reluctant parties, such as the Department of Defense, to clean up these sites, the idea of instantly making municipal governments and airports liable for every PFAS chemical through no fault of their own is concerning. I know some people uh, want the EPA to publish a maximum containment level, or MCL, for all PFAS in drinking water. However, an MCL is not essential for a Superfund cleanup. EPA has already adjusted downward its lifetime health advisory, and EPA is working on making a legally defensible decision on the regulation of PFOA and, and PFOS. I am concerned that short-circuiting the evidence-based science-driven, risk-informed process could force the EPA to uh, shortcut necessary elements to issuing a strong and legally sustainable regulation. 
I know right to know reporting of PFAS holdings is a priority for many, and there are places where it makes sense. But the bill that was uh, recently introduced would massively expand the number of chemicals that would need to be reported under the toxic release inventory by as much as 5,000. It would also reduce by 90 percent the threshold at which a person would be required to report and apply these requirements to business with less than 10 people. Finally, if we were to assume the majority like all these proposals enacted, the cumulative and aggregate effect of all these statutory requirements and regulations could have a stifling impact on EPA activities. States could face significant unfunded mandates while foisting obligations on private parties who are currently unaware of potential liability, like farmers using biosolids from wastewater treatment facilities to improve soil health. All of this is likely to result in litigation to pre prevent or prolong the situation uh, rather than move to promptly address contamination. So I want to be part of the solution, preferably the one reported by this committee. And I hope our friends on the other side of the aisle are serious, and I believe they are, and sincere in their willingness to work with us, which I think they are, because um, it's a big deal, and we've got to get it right. As currently constituted, the language in the bills before us present an enormous sweeping response to the PFAS chemical class. It's important that we take a close look to make sure the actions we take are justified by science. So, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate uh, uh, you having this hearing. I know we got notice of it Friday, and uh, our team was working through the weekend to look at all these bills, um, but it's important to do. We want to move on this as well. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I was about to recognize Representative Upton as you walked in the room, uh, and so why don't we recognize you for 30 seconds? Please. Well, I just want to say, Mr. Chairman, thank you for, for holding this hearing. I appreciate uh, I, I intend to be here most of the morning, uh, ask questions at my turn at the end as, a, as I am not a member of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm glad that we're looking at a whole number of bipartisan bills. This is an issue that maybe Michigan knows better than anybody else just because we've done more discovery than anybody else, and that should then not be an excuse for the rest of us to be engaged on an issue that truly impacts uh, the health and safety of every American. So I want to thank both of you. And uh, just to, to conclude, uh, the work on TSCA, uh, a bill that we moved with strong, unanimous support out of this committee, set the stage for where we are today. So again, your leadership there has brought us to where we are. We want to work with the administration to get it done, and I look forward to continuing my questions at the end of the hearing. Thank you. Yield okay. The gentleman yields. The chair would uh, like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' written opening statements shall be made part of the record. With that, we'll proceed to introduce our witnesses for today's hearing. First, I'll introduce Ms. Emily Marp, mother and community member from Petersburg, New York. Emily and I have had conversation in the past, and uh, you have a painful story, and uh, we really appreciate you sharing with us this morning. Um, next, we have uh, Dr. Jamie DeWitt, uh, Associate Professor of the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology at Brody School of Medicine at East Carolina University. Then we have Mr. Brian Steglitz, uh, who received praise from Congresswoman Dingell uh, as manager in water treatment services uh, um, uh, at the city of Ann Arbor. Then Ms. Tracy, uh, Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Tracy Meehan, Executive Director of Government Affairs at American Water Works Association. Uh, then Ms. Jane Luxton, partner, co-chair of the Environmental and Administrative Law Practice uh, of Lewis Brisbane. Brisboy, thank you. And Mr. Eric Olson, uh, Health Program Director uh, with Natural Resources Defense Council. We thank each and every one of you for being here. Before we begin with your statements, I would like to explain our lighting system, which I believe we have up and running today. Um, in front of you are a series of lights. The lights will initially be uh, green at the start of your opening statement. The light will turn yellow when you have one minute remaining. Please begin to wrap up your testimony. At that point, the light will turn red when your time expires. And at this point, uh, the chair will now recognize uh, Ms. Emily Marp uh, for five minutes to provide um, her opening statement. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Can yeah. we get a little closer? Move the mic a little bit closer. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Emily Marpy, and I'm a mother of three. At the beginning of this, I was only a mother of two. No, I have three. Um, 
Ooh, first up, that's different. Okay, so first I want to start by thanking two men that started the journey for everyone involved, um, Mr. Rob Blott and Michael Hickey, a resident of Hoosick Falls, for finding the contamination in our area. To those two gentlemen, I am forever grateful and thankful they saved my family. Okay, so in February of 2016, I was informed by a letter in the mail that they wanted to do a study and test our water for PFOA. Um, after the letter I called scheduled it, they came, they tested, our private well tested at 2.1 parts per billion of PFOA. Um, we called our, our house Cloud Nine because throughout the buying process, like I, we came from a two bedroom trailer. At times there were seven of us crammed in the two bedroom trailer. I don't know if you've ever lived in one, but one bathroom, not fun. Um, and then I worked so hard to become a first time home buyer at 29 and to give my children their first home. It was a three bedroom ranch um, on spacious 2.38 acres. Beautiful, private, secluded, everything we wanted after we had neighbors at our back door for 10 years and it was great. Um, the day I received the results, I was just told, stop brushing your teeth immediately. Yeah, that's what he said to me on the phone. Um, it's just like a drop of water in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. We then went on to get our blood tested. Um, when I pulled in the driveway and got the results, I opened my son's first because he spent weekends with his father, so I knew he was exposed the least. His blood level was 103 parts per billion. I then moved on to my 10-year-old daughter. She was 207 parts per billion. That was a little tough to take, seeing the, the increase. Um, I then opened my own. I was 322 parts per billion. And then Gwen's father was 418 parts per billion. He was comparable to a DuPont worker. And I'd like to remind you, we only lived there for four and a half years. <sighs> Still mind blowing to this day. <sighs> um, I lost myself. My kids lost their mom. I started missing games. I started missing concerts. I was consumed. I fell in the PFOA rabbit hole. I couldn't read enough. I couldn't research enough. I couldn't meet enough people. I couldn't. I brought my calendar from then to show you. Like, this is pre PFOA, okay? This is after. It consumed me, literally. Um, Gwen, my daughter who's sitting behind me, I still hear it today because I still attend meetings and I still do things like this. They're, they're my family. My job is to protect them. You know, we, we were living the American dream. Our bubble was popped in a horrible way. Uh, the safety and security of our home fell from under our feet. I couldn't sleep at night. How do you open your window knowing that the stacks are blowing and your kids are out in the tent sleeping in your yard and it's falling on them, literally falling on them as they sleep? It's not a comfortable feeling. Um, I ended up selling my home and that was a challenging experience in itself. Um, and then two and a half years after I stopped drinking the water, I became pregnant with my daughter Eliana. I can't express to you the fear of knowing the story of West Virginia and Parkersburg and all of those towns in Ohio and West Virginia. Um, at 20 weeks, most mothers are so excited to find out the sex of their child. I was just praying for two nostrils and her eyes to be okay. I didn't want her to have to suffer like others have. Um, this is Ellie. She's 10 months now. She's beautiful. Um, when you, you say there's not enough studies, I, I've been diagnosed with thyroid disease. My daughter Gwen now has a pediatric endocrinologist. Um, we're, we're suffering the health effects. They're already here, and we're only six years later. I, I don't know what else to say. That I mean, our, our lives should be more than profit. It's really mind-blowing that it's not. Um, Congress needs to treat this as a crisis because it is a crisis. I mean, all the mothers out there, I couldn't breastfeed. 
I couldn't do the most basic thing a mother does for my child because I knew that it would elevate Ellie's levels. She already got it from me. When she was seven weeks old, she tested at 75.9 parts per billion. She was higher than 1,573 people out of 2,081 tested in the first round of blood testing in Hoosick Falls, New York. That's disgusting. Disgusting. At a minimum, Congress needs to force companies like Taconic Plastics to report their PFAS releases and to force our water utilities to tell us if their drinking water is polluted with PFAS chemicals. Most importantly, private wells. I mean, these people are left hanging. My house was a half a mile from the plant. The municipal supply got tested before mine. That was a mile away. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Murphy. Uh, next, we'll move to uh, Dr. DeWitt. Um, you have five minutes to present your opening statement. Chairman Tonko, Ranking Member Shimkus, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, good morning, and thank you for inviting me to speak to you with to speak with you about health effects of exposure to per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS, chemicals that are estimated to contaminate the drinking water of 19 million Americans. My name is Dr. Jamie DeWitt, and I'm an associate professor of pharmacology and toxicology at East Carolina University. I've been conducting research on health effects of PFAS since 2005 with a focus on the immune system. PFAS, as you know, are a class of nearly 5,000 closely related chemicals. They all contain a carbon-fluorine bond. This bond makes them highly stable, heat-resistant, and versatile in manufacturing processes and consumer goods. This bond also makes PFAS extremely long-lived in the environment and in our bodies as they do not readily biodegrade. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention assesses the U.S. population's exposure to environmental chemicals in a cross-section of the population. They've reported that 98% of Americans in have at least one or more PFAS in their blood. Currently, my state of North Carolina is part of the PFAS crisis. To better understand PFAS contamination in our state and their health risks, I'm part of this PFAS testing network. It's a collaborative partnership of seven different North Carolina-based universities using both federal grants and a substantial state investment to focus our PFAS research efforts. The North Carolina Policy Collaboratory, which was created in 2016 by the North Carolina General Assembly to better utilize academic expertise across institutions of higher learning within our state oversees the network. We can be a model for other states to understand PFAS. Our scientific understanding of health effects of PFAS is still growing. Of the 5,000 PFAS, two have been very well studied and a handful have limited data. That said, in the last couple of years, there's been a concerted effort among researchers to expand our understanding of PFAS. A comprehensive evaluation of toxicological data for 14 different PFAS compiled by the agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry reported that people exposed to PFAS experience a variety of health effects. These associations include decreased antibody responses to vaccines, liver damage, changes in serum lipids and cholesterol, increased risk of thyroid disease, increased risk of asthma, increased risk of decreased fertility, decreases in birth weight, and increases in pregnancy-induced preeclampsia and hypertension. Some populations have also seen increases in the incidence of, liver and, of kidney and testicular cancer associated with exposure. These health effects indicate that developing organisms, the immune system, the endocrine system, and metabolic systems all are sensitive endpoints to PFAS exposure. These also indicate that PFAS has, have carcinogenic abilities. These adverse health effects also have been observed in experimental animals fed individual PFAS. Data from experimental animals is an important component of human health research. It's this combination of data from studies of exposed human populations, experimental animals, and molecular mechanisms that has broadened our understanding of how PFAS exposure leads to adverse health effects in humans. Prevention, including vaccines, is a first line of defense against diseases. We need vaccines to be effective. Exposure to PFOA and PFOS, two well-studied PFAS, reduces the immune system's ability to produce antibodies, making our vaccines less effective. PFAS-associated immune system effects observed in epi epidemiological studies of children and adults and in experimental animal studies of individual PFAS have supported a causal relationship. In 2016, the National Toxicology Program evaluated immune studies of PFOA and PFOS and concluded that they are presumed to be immune hazards to humans because they can oppress the ability suppress the ability of the immune system to make antibodies. There's also evidence that these chemicals can have effects on allergic responses, resistance to infectious disease, and autoimmune disease. It's time for Congress to act. 
Of the 5,000 known PFAS, the vast majority have no associated research data or standards for human biomonitoring. But it's not really feasible from a time or resource perspective to test our way out of this crisis. Employing a class approach for all PFAS will be protective for vulnerable subpopulations as well as the general public. It's not too late. Following the voluntary removal of PFOA and PFOS from our environment, levels of these PFAS have decreased in the environment and in our bodies. Since that time, however, replacement PFAS have increased in production. We need to learn more about these replacement compounds and ask ourselves, are these essential for the public good? Thank you for understanding the need for legislation that will diminish the number and amounts of PFAS contaminating our environment and our bodies. Thank you, Dr. DeWitt. We'll now move to uh, Mr. Brian Steglitz for five minutes, please. Good morning, Chairman Tonko and Ranking Member Shimkus and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for conducting this hearing and for inviting me to testify today. Thanks also to Congressman Upton, Congressman Wahlberg, and Congresswoman Dingell from Michigan for your bipartisan commitment and support to address critical public health and drinking water issues facing our state and the nation. My name is Brian Steglitz, and I'm the manager of water treatment services for the city of Ann Arbor, Michigan. The city of Ann Arbor is in southeastern Michigan, and our utility serves about 125,000 customers, except for about eight Saturdays in the fall when the city's population doubles. Yes, we're home to the University of Michigan Wolverines. Um, in early 2017, the city began investigating a new type of carbon in its filters to remove PFAS from its source waters. In 2018 and 2019, the city invested approximately $850,000 in this new carbon, which is about 10% of our operating budget. PFAS, however, cannot be addressed with a single capital investment. We will need to increase the annual expense of carbon replacement by over a factor of two to achieve effective PFAS removal at our plant. While we've come up with a solution to ensure the city's drinking water is safe and public health is protected, removal, removing these chemicals at the end of the pipe is not the most cost-effective approach. The best way to address these contaminants is at their source. Currently, utilities are in a situation where chemicals of unknown risk are entering circulation, are not being monitored, are discharged from industrial sources and municipal wastewater treatment plants into watersheds and enter the source water for drinking water systems. It may not be until chemicals are already detected in drinking water that risk assessment and exposure evaluations are initiated. This is just too late. For those chemicals that are already in circulation and being actively used by industry, more effective controls are needed to ensure these chemicals are not allowed to enter our watersheds, as well as legislation that would require the polluter to cover the costs of abatement. As utilities develop solutions to address PFAS contaminants, many of these solutions may require significant capital investment. How is a utility to be sure that near-term investments are able to address long-term public health risks, when much of the science on public health impacts has yet to be developed? While financial resources for utilities to address PFAS contamination sites are critical, resources to address research are equally important. Until the water community can understand the public health risks, it will not be able to ensure that appropriate resources are dedicated to addressing PFAS. There are many other significant needs that cannot be neglected as utilities stretch their resources to address PFAS. Aging infrastructure, lead, algal toxins, to name a few, remain at the forefront of water quality issues facing drinking water systems. Federal government leadership will be critical to putting the country on the right path to addressing PFAS contamination and exposure. The most common question that we receive from our customers is, is our water safe to drink? Ann Arbor is no different than utilities all over the country who are facing this similar question. Historically, utilities would commonly answer this question with an emphatic yes, we comply with Safe Drinking Water Act requirements. Even though this is still true, because there are no regulatory limits for any PFAS, this response is no longer acceptable to our customers. While EPA considers future regulation, many states, including Michigan, are not willing to wait. Over the next few years, there will likely be many different regulatory approaches taken across the United States. Why is this problematic? It's difficult to communicate to your customers in New Jersey or Minnesota or Vermont uh, that has evaluated the risk to their residents differently and that one state places a lower value on protection of public health than another. Ann Arbor customers, as well as many other communities around the United States, will accept nothing less than the most stringent requirements. That is why we have taken the approach to select the most stringent PFAS limits that exist and use these as our own current water quality goals. One may think that we really didn't need to take such an aggressive approach, but customer confidence and trust is the foundation of a successful utility. We, along with other utilities around the country, will be asking much from our customers in the future as we seek rate support for much needed investment. If we are unable to satisfy 
the water quality expectations of our customers, we will not be able to sustain the revenue support that we need to ensure that we can deliver safe water for the next generations in our communities. For these reasons, federal leadership is critical. <laughs> to recap, we need stronger control of the chemicals that enter circulation in the United States, source water protection to ensure contaminants do not enter watersheds, to hold polluters accountable for cleaning up contaminated sites, financial support for research and to implement new treatment technologies and regulatory oversight that has been vetted by the best science. With these tools, utilities will be best positioned to address PFAS contamination and succeed in their common missions to protect public health. Thank you for your attention to this important issue. Thank you, Mr. Steglitz. And now we recognize Mr. Tracy Meehan for five minutes, please. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, my name is Tracy Meehan, and I'm Executive Director for Government Affairs for the American Water Works Association, on whose behalf I'm speaking today. I appreciate this opportunity, as do our members, to offer our AWWA's perspectives on the many pressing issues surrounding PFAS. Uh, let me, since this is Infrastructure Week, I do want to thank the committee for your work on uh, reauthorizing the Safe Drinking Water State Revolving Loan Fund and doubling the authorized amount, as well as putting WIFIA on a more permanent footing. These two programs are key in dealing what is a paramount uh, threat to public health, that is aging and, and uh, deteriorating infrastructure. So uh, my members are most grateful for your work on that. Um, AWWA's 50,000 members including 4,000 utility members that are subsumed in that 50,000 figure, represent the full spectrum of utilities, small and large, rural and urban, municipal and investor owned. Uh, so in addition, I'm speaking not just as an AWWA person, but as a former state and federal regulator and an adjunct professor of environmental law. Let me, let me say first up that all our members are conscious, extremely conscious of the concerns and the fears and the aspirations of our members. We are customer facing more now than ever. Uh, this is a post Flint environment and it, believe me, it, uh, public affairs, risk communication are priorities for all of our members and good education as to what we know and what we don't know is first and foremost in all our members' minds. Drinking water utilities and state environmental agencies need to know where to focus monitoring resources to understand what risks may be in source waters and to implement source water protection practices and engagement with, with these sources. That's a fundamental principle of what we do, as, as Brian mentioned. There are existing tools that EPA could be using to a greater degree to help address such concerns regarding PFAS. In particular, as was noted, the Toxic Substance Control Act, or TSCA. Uh, deploying these TSCA authorities in the service of safe drinking water is source water protection at the strategic level. Uh, you call it prevention, if you will, as Brian indicated. Utilizing its oversight authority over the work of federal agencies, we urge Congress to ensure that EPA takes advantage of such existing authorities under TSCA to manage risk posed by PFAS compounds. Using such authority, we think the agency needs to provide a report in one year and updated every two years, describing the location of current and past PFAS production, import, processing, and use in the United States for individual PFAS compounds based on data collected through TSCA. It should also show appropriate actions taken or planned under TSCA to restrict production, use, and import of PFAS and support improved risk communications with the public. Actions taken by the, also report on actions taken by other federal agencies, and in particular the Department of Defense and Health and Human Services to address PFAS concerns. And finally, report on statutory and non-statutory barriers encountered in gathering and distributing information on PFAS in order to inform risk management decisions by EPA, states, and local risk managers. EPA officials have promised uh, to issue a proposed regulatory determination for PFAS and PFO under the safe drinking water processes this year. We urge Congress to support EPA's Office of Water, particularly on the appropriations side, as it works through the rule determination process. With regard to the federal drinking water standard process, we understand that the process can be frustratingly low, or slow, excuse me. However, a scientific risk-based and data-driven process that discerns what substances are to be regulated and at what levels is indeed going to take a significant amount of time and effort. We caution against setting a precedent of bypassing these established processes via legislative action. 
The nation tested this approach with the 1986 amendments of the Safe Drinking Water Act with untoward results, and I was on the receiving end of that as a state official at the Missouri DNR at the time. That said, we're eager to follow the data on PFAS compounds wherever it may go in the investigative process so that we may know how best to protect public health. We will then prepare our members to comply with any new regulations and they will do so expeditiously. In our 2012 study, Buried No Longer, AWWA determined that the United States needs to spend about a trillion dollars over 25 years to maintain, expand, and replace our current level of, of water, drinking water infrastructure. And that's just on the drinking water side of the house. Therefore, over time, regulatory actions need to be prudently implemented to avoid aggravating affordability issues for customers, particularly those with low incomes. Uh, we just came out with our rate survey for 2016 to 2018, and it showed that uh, it was up 7.2 to 7.5 percent, twice the level of the CPI. So this is a risk-risk situation, and we need to target real risk and get true reduction and, uh, and pay attention to the cost side. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. And now we recognize Ms. Jane Luxton for five minutes, please. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Tonko, Ranking Member Shimkus, and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to testify today on legislation that has been introduced to address PFAS contamination. My name is Jane Luxton. I'm a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of the law firm Lewis Brisbois and co-chair of its environmental and administrative law practice. I was informed this morning by committee staff that a lawsuit was filed last night in which a firm client is named as a defendant. This is the first I've heard of this, and I'm not involved in that case. Um, I am appearing today on my own behalf as an environmental and administrative law practitioner with decades of experience with a, environmental regulatory matters. Today, I would like to speak to the broader issue of the challenges surrounding the regulation of PFAS chemicals and address a few of the specific bills the committee is considering. There is no question this is a serious issue. We have heard testimony about the research that has been conducted on PFAS chemicals, and the fact is most of it has been concentrated on PFOA and PFOS, but much less is known about the other PFAS compounds. These compound, compounds vary in terms of specific chemical structure, chain length, and composition, and these differences matter in terms of fate and degradation in the environment, as well as toxicity, uptake, and retention in humans, plants, and animals. Dr. Linda Birnbaum, director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and National Toxicology Program, testified before a Senate subcommittee last fall that, quote, we do not have strong data on which to base conclusions for the great majority of thousands of PFAS compounds, and we have only limited findings that support particular adverse health effects, close quote. A great deal of academic and governmental research is currently underway to determine the extent of causal links between exposure to PFOA, PFOS, and the many other PFAS compounds and specific health effects in humans, there is a solid consensus that more research is needed. There is also wide agreement that the federal government has an important role to play in regulating these chemicals, and it is equally important that those regulations be based on up-to-date, credible scientific research, good data, and legally sound procedures. Imposing blanket regulations on thousands of PFAS chemicals, as some of the proposed legislation proposes to do, when scientists agree we have at best limited information on most, risks losing focus on the highest priority concerns. As the Centers for Disease Control stated in its most recent report, quote, finding a measurable amount of PFAS in blood does not imply the levels cause an adverse health effect, close quote, and quote, small amounts of PFAS may be of no health consequence, close quote. An indiscriminate approach would impose extraordinary costs on federal agencies, states, and local governments requiring funds they simply do not have, while diluting resources that should be targeted on the highest risk chemicals. Even chemicals of demonstrably significant concern, such as dioxin, PCBs, and PAHs, have been found on examination to differ significantly in terms of potency among individual congeners or types of, of chemicals. The alternative of attempting to impose a one-size-fits-all approach to regulating PFAS chemicals poses a real risk of doing harm. 
Bills that direct agencies to issue specific federal regulations can present other challenges. For example, agencies must adhere to the rulemaking requirements of the Administrative Procedure Act, which requires agencies to follow a series of steps providing for transparency in decision making, a defensible administrative record, analyses of the benefits and costs of the regulatory action and the feasibility of alternatives, and due process in the form of public notice and comment if a regulation is to withstand review by the courts. It does little good to issue a regulation if it's going to be struck down by the courts as inadequate under the law. It only leads to delay in the effectiveness of any regulatory initiative. EPA's action plan is um, consider, includes action under both CERCLA and the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, EPA is taking steps to designate PFOA and PFOS as circular hazardous substances, which would provide additional power to regulate responsible parties and require them to undertake and or pay for the remediation. But expanding this approach to all PFAS compounds, as H.R. 535 seeks to do, could lead to wholesale reopening of remediated sites, potentially overwhelming the program and undermining progress on the highest risk targets. With respect to other bills, H.R. 2577 would amend the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act of 1986 to require reporting on releases of PFAS through the Toxics Release Inventory. The PFAS of greatest concern, of course, are no longer being <coughs> manufactured, so releases of these compounds from manufacturing is extremely unlikely. Requiring reporting on thousands of other compounds, the toxicity of which is not established, is of uncertain value. This proposed legislation would greatly expand reporting requirements at great cost. Thank you, Ms. Luxton. And we now move to Mr. Uh, uh, Eric Olson for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member uh, Shimkus. Um, I'm Eric Olson. I oversee the health team at Natural Resources Defense Council. and. You know, I, I want to talk about PFAS because this is a chem these chemicals are in pretty much every person in this room is carrying PFAS in your body. Many of those compounds um, have been tested and many have not been tested, and we are actually all walking around as guinea pigs, um, being exposed to these chemicals, carrying them in our bodies, and in many cases, um, there are adverse health effects that we are very concerned about. I spent part of last night with about 30 um, individuals from across the country who have come to D.C. to talk about their experience with PFAS contamination, um, much like Emily's story. We heard about people whose family members had birth defects, people who were suffering from cancer of the testicles, cancer of the kidneys, other effects that really are of concern. These are real worries, and unfortunately, this class of chemicals shares three very consistent um, properties that are really worrisome. One is they're very toxic at low doses. When we test them and we look at them, the more we learn, the more toxic we know they are. Secondly, they are extremely persistent. These are forever chemicals. The carbon fluorine bond makes them that way. And we now know at least 600 sites across the country are contaminated, and we haven't looked in most places. I can guarantee you that every congressional district has a PFAS contamination problem. It just may not have been discovered yet. And thirdly, they are all very mobile. Um, and the reason that's a problem is they get into drinking water, they get into soils, they get into people. The health effects we've heard about, and they are in many cases heartbreaking. I want to talk about um, what we need to do about this problem. Unfortunately, um, We've got a class of chemicals, as you've heard, three to 5,000 of these, um, about 4,700 according to many reports. We need to deal with this class. Think about what we, how could we possibly regulate these one by one. If you've got 4,700 chemicals and it takes EPA years to regulate a single chemical, how many millennia is it going to take to regulate thousands of chemicals? Um, we've got to deal with this as a class. We know that they share common properties, and we know that they um, are causing adverse effects in too many cases. So first of all, we need to stop approving new uses of these chemicals and new PFAS chemicals. We, and there is a bill by Ms. Dean that would do that. We need to also phase out the existing products. I'm sorry, Ms. Dean's pro, um, bill would 
phase out existing products, um, Ms. Custer's bill actually would address the new products and the new uses, and we need to stop those. Secondly, we need to document and disclose the extent of the problem. So it's important to be monitoring groundwater and drinking water, figure out how widespread the problem is. There is legislation that would do that, uh, have USGS do that. We think there's a need for new legislation not yet introduced that would force comprehensive monitoring of drinking water. We've seen it in Michigan, and when you test, in, when Michigan tested, they found sites all over the state um, with contamination. Most states have not done this. In fact, virtually no other state has done anything close to what Michigan has done. We need to also make sure that the manufacturers and processors disclose the use and, and also the, the um, discharges, releases of those chemicals. And um, we certainly have a bill from Antonio Del Delgado that would address that through the toxic release inventory. We also need consumers to be informed so they can make intelligent choices. If you go into the grocery store or you go into Target, it would be good to know whether the products you're buying have PFAS on them. We would like a safer choice pro program that would deal with the full array of consumer products and disclose. We also think it's important to have cleanup authorities. One of the big issues here, and Ms. Dingle, um, thank you for introducing a bill th with Mr. Upton that would address um, these issues under Superfund. It's very important to have the class of PFAS uh, controlled under CERCLA so that we can for ensure cleanup. Polluters should be paying for the cleanup, um, and we certainly support a user fee that would help um, ensure that some of those polluters are paying. We need regulation of the air emissions and the water emissions under the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act. Sewage sludge contamination is a big problem. We talked last night to a farmer in Maine who had applied sewage sludge to his dairy um, area where they were grazing, his cattle were grazing, severe contamination of all of his cows. Um, he has to throw away all his milk. He's going to have to um, basically get rid of his um, dairy cows because they're so contaminated. So we need to deal with all these sources and ultimately um, clean up the contamination that's already been caused. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We've concluded the witnesses' opening statements. We now will move to member questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask questions of our witnesses, and I get to start by recognizing myself for five minutes. So as I, when I quickly acknowledged one of our witnesses earlier, I talked, and several of the witnesses mentioned how Michigan's been hard hit by PFAS. It's in our drinking water, groundwater, rivers, lakes, and ponds. It's contaminated fish and other wildlife. PFAS foam is still washing up and collecting across the state in places like the Huron River watershed, which goes throughout my district, and near former military bases. We've even had to tell people don't eat the foam. I know you would think you wouldn't have to tell people that, but you do. This chemical is impacting both Democratic and Republican districts, and Fred Upton, Tim Wahlberg, and I are all very concerned in working together. So as you say, Michigan is ground zero for PFAS sites, but it's because we are looking at it and addressing it, which many other states are not. It's a growing threat nationwide. Comprehensive and bipartisan solutions exist today to deal with these toxic man-made forever chemicals. We're serious in a very bipartisan way about ridding these hazardous chemicals wherever they exist, from our drinking water, firefighting phones, consumer products, food containers, that bill is coming, uh, and the air we breathe. Each of these bills we're considering today, most with bipartisan support, are meaningful solutions Congress must move forward on now. So uh, because we've got so many of you, and I'm going to take personal privilege, Brian, these questions are going to be for you. I'm going to begin with you. Can you explain the technologies you are employing as well as the costs you have experienced to remove PFAS from Ann Arbor's drinking water? Um, we currently use uh, carbon, granule activated carbon in concrete filters to remove the PFAS. As the water flows through the filter media, um, the PFAS attaches to the carbon particles. Um, when the filters are washed, the PFAS stays attached. So the PFAS can only be removed through high temperature thermal treatment. Um, and this is the way that PFAS can be destroyed, which is really important 
um, when we're looking at for, for solutions to address PFAS contamination, so we're not moving the PFAS from one source or media to another. Um, it's important for these chemicals to be destroyed because if they're not, they can make it back into the environment. Um, the cost impact um, for our customers has been a 3 to 4 percent rate increase to deal with the one-time replacement of the carbon and approximately 1 percent per year after due to the increased frequency that we need to. Are there any innovative solutions to address PFAS contamination from a watershed approach that you're considering? It's more effective to remove uh, these contaminants um, and chemicals at the source. Um, the city's begun conversations with the state of Michigan and upstream sources to evaluate implementing more robust treatment for these chemicals um, at, and dealing with that in the watershed as opposed, as opposed to the end of the pipe. The reason why this is innovative is because right now um, industrial uh, dischargers, municipal wastewater treatment plants, and drinking water treatment plants are all regulated in silos. So by looking at the PFAS contamination from a watershed approach, we can come up with more effective um, solutions to address the pollution at the place where it's most cost effectively removed. I'm going to ask you two questions quickly because um, we're running out of time. I know that Ann Arbor residents, because I hear from them regularly like you do, are worried about the safety of their chemicals. And how are you communicating the risks? And how does the federal government help you? And in the absence of federal leadership, what actions are the city of Ann Arbor and Michigan taking? And from a water utilities perspective, how important is federal leadership to effectively protect human health and the environment from PFAS? Well, we found that um, transparent and frequent communication was critical uh, to maintaining support from our customers. Um, by statute, we're obligated to report on our water quality annually. But beginning this month in May, we decided to do monthly water quality reports that have a dashboard for our customers to illustrate current water quality. And a copy of our report is included with my written testimony. We've, got a, we've had a lot of good feedback um, from our customers um, on this approach. Um, and we've been posting all of our analytical results to our, to our website, which is uh, qualitywatermatters.org. There's a lot of good information that ATSDR and EPA have on their websites about PFAS, but the real challenge that we're facing is how do you communicate about contaminants where the risk um, is unknown and the science is developing. And this is a place where we, more federal leadership would be helpful to provide us the tools that we need to, to communicate around these difficult issues. Thank you. I'm going to quickly move to Mr. Olson because uh, we're running out of time. But Mr. Olson, if PFAS chemicals were listed as a hazardous substance under the Superfund program, what would this mean for the 610 PFAS contamination sites identified across 43 states and our ability to clean up these harmful chemicals in the environment? Well, it would help to designate them under the Superfund law because it would give the muscular authority to the federal government and to states to try to force cleanup at a lot of these sites. They would have to prioritize the sites. They would have to evaluate how severe the contamination was and then construct some kind of um, program to make sure that they clean them up, which is really important. Thank you. I'm out of time, so I will... Now yield to Mr. Shimkus for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, so many questions, so little time. So I'm going to go to Mr. Meehan. Uh, some of my colleagues have made the argument that we need to force EPA to regulate all PFAS, and we've already been talking about that. And we're talking four to 6,000 uh, chemicals. Because EPA hasn't issued a regulation under the Safe Drinking Water Act since 1996. Do you agree that EPA has been sitting on its regulatory hands for the past 22 plus years through multiple administrations when it comes to drinking water? Uh, thank you. Uh, and Mr. be Kim. quick, I got hold. Yeah, of uh, <laughs> no, it's an urban legend. Uh, when I was at the agency in 2001, we got out the arsenic rule. That was a <clears> long <throat> effort. I, it, did, it wasn't fast, but we got it out. There's been a radionuclides rule. There's a filter backwash recycle rule. There's two disinfection byproduct rules. There's an enhanced surface water treatment rule, long-term one and long-term two enhanced surface water treatment, groundwater rule, lead and copper rule has been revised, revised total coliform. We have 15 health advisories that while they're not MCLs, they have impacts. We are here today because of a health advisory on this issue. Uh, there's also been five information request rules that have put literally hundreds of millions of dollars of burden on utilities. I mean, Brian could probably speak to this. Uh, and in addition, we have to look at the overall regulatory effort that goes on with the contaminant, <clears throat> the candidate contaminant list 
and the unregulated contaminant moderating rule, which the, by which the agency under the law winnows and sifts what risks need to be regulated, and in that process they've identi identified 24 or so contaminants that should not be regulated, which is as important as identifying those that should. So I, I, we certainly don't feel okay, like let, they've taken a vacation. Yeah, thank that. you. Let me cut you off there. And you, men, you mentioned lead and copper, which we think is coming relatively yeah. soon. Uh, perchlorate is probably another one that's going to be coming relatively soon. I think that's more than probable, right? <laughs> <laughs> Under a court order. Right. So, I mean, so yeah. here's the issue. Uh, we have a process. We have a system. So if someone would litigate those rules, mm -hmm. if they go through the process, they would probably lose in court. If we supersede the system by doing a law without going through the regulatory process of, <laughs> of testing, do we risk nothing happening on this? Well, I take the agency at their word. They're certainly looking at performance. No, I'm just talking, I'm just talking about if we go the whole class of if, chemicals if, without – we know that the most studied of these are PFAS and PFOA, right? At this moment, yeah. Right. And, that, and we've got four to 6,000 chemicals. If we, uh, by legislative fiat, ban – uh, four to 5,000 chemicals without the due diligence of a scientific analysis, do we risk uh, infinitum litigation and no action on this? Uh, I don't want to prejudge litigation, but you would probably see a lot of people concerned about precipitous action without a, a good risk assessment and benefit cost analysis. Let me go to Ms. Luxton. Um, uh, I know there are concerns with Gen X and about two dozen other PFAS chemicals. Uh, I've already, you've already heard the 4,000, 6,000 other uh, derivations of this. Um, are you aware of any class of chemicals that has been regulated so thoroughly without regard to actual supporting evidence of toxicity? No, that's not been done. And as I mentioned in my testimony, dioxins, PCBs, PAHs, many other highly toxic substances have been on study discovered to have significant differences in toxicity and, and uptake and, and uh, impacts on human health with respect to the specific compound. And it does matter which type of PFAS we're talking about. So if we go down this course, would this precedent bother you? Yes, I, I think there would be litigation. There's um, no question, and to just sort of impose blanket bans is um, highly risky. It it risks overcorrecting, if you want to put it that way, <clears throat> and and changing, uh, diluting the priorities that need to be focused on the highest risks. Yeah, and let me go, Mr. Stiglitz, because I do believe that our. Water providers uh, do the best they can to meet the standards. There's a lot of capital cost. If you were asked to regulate a chemical that was safe, well, would you want to do that? Would, if you had to clean out a chemical from the water system that was safe and it cost a huge capital expense, would you, would you say, I'm going to do that? We obviously have limited resources, so we would want to be focusing on the, the contaminants that have public health risks. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shimkus. Chairman now yields five minutes to Chairman Pallone. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just want to say it just seems like everywhere we look for these toxic chemicals on water, we find them. It's, there's so much that needs to be done. But one of the things I always believed is that polluters are responsible for this contamination and they should be responsible primarily for the cleanup. And so I was pleased to see uh, strong action in my home state of New Jersey with this lawsuit filed just yesterday against the makers of PFAS firefighting foam. But I wanted to ask, you know, I mentioned 13 different bills. Uh, let me just ask some questions about some of them. First, H.R. 2377, introduced by Representative Boyle, sets a deadline for EPA to set a national drinking water standard for total PFAS. Again, New Jersey has set a maximum contaminant level for some PFAS. That's the first in the country. But let me ask Mr. Olson first, how would a national drinking water standard protect communities and states without standards, and how could it drive up Superfund cleanups? Well, 
basically there's an urgent need for standards, enforceable standards for drinking water. Um, we believe that the states are moving forward. You mentioned New Jersey. Several other states are moving forward, Michigan and others, with drinking water standards. The problem is that some states are not doing that. Um, so ideally, you would like strong health protective national standards, and Mr. Boyle's bill would um, require standards to be set for the class. Our main concern is that the underlying statute under the Safe Drinking Water Act, when it was amended in 1996, makes it virtually impossible to set strong, good standards, or it makes it very challenging for EPA to move forward with new standards of unregulated contaminants. And that's why we would need a legislation. That's right. Now, what about driving Superfund cleanups? How would that impact it? Well, Superfund cleanups, um, Superfund lists chemicals that, are, that have a maximum contaminant level. Those are considered what are called applicable, relevant, and appropriate regulations, or ARARs, that would drive the cleanup. Okay. Ms. Mr. Stieglitz, how could a national drinking water standard help affected water systems access uh, say, um, revolving loan, state revolving loan funds to address PFAS contamination? Well, some, some states have um, requirements for regulatory compliance as a driver for receiving points as potential projects are evaluated for competing resources. So it would help facilitate um, access to revolving loan funds in some states. Well, there's a standard, of course, is only part of the solution. And whether or not a standard is in place, drinking water utilities are moving forward with PFAS treatment. So again, Mr. Siglis, what capital costs has your water system faced in addressing PFAS contamination? We spent just under a million dollars to um, replace some of our uh, filter media. Um, but we'll also have an ongoing cost of approximately um, $350,000 a year to replace um, because it has a limited life expectancy when you're using the filter carbon for PFAS removal. And what's the effect uh, of this on your operations and maintenance costs? It's a, the capital investment was about a 3 to 4 percent um, increase in revenue that we required um, that we had to pass on to our customers. And then the, the continuing operate, operation and maintenance costs will be about 1 percent. So, Mr. Mean, can water utilities across the country absorb those kinds of costs without additional assistance? Are they going to be able to do that without additional assistance? Well, um, one of our members, uh, and Dr. DeWitt may be up on this, uh, uh, Cape Fear, uh, North Carolina, which had the issue with Shemores and Gen X, uh, is actually spending $40 million, I think, for uh, gen uh, granular activated carbon. They're sucking it up. Their rate payers are going to pick that up. And that was a pretty up-to-speed system, if I can use that term. Uh, so yeah, right now, uh, they will do what they have to do if there is public demand and political leadership demanding that, uh, that it be treated. But again, there's no question that if you do 5,000 chemicals under an MCL or a treatment standard, uh, that's going to have un foreseen costs that are going to affect other investments, whether it's lead service line replacement or dealing with microbial dis disinfection right. byproducts. We haven't talked about that. That's a big priority. All right, let me just get in one more question to Mr. Mm -hmm. Olson about adoption of more effective drinking water treatment techniques and how it benefits public health. i sorry to cut you off. We just That's wanted to get one question. Well, benefit. I think it's important. And, and one issue with um, these technologies like granular activated carbon or reverse osmosis which were two of the technologies they're going to remove much of the class, especially reverse osmosis. It's going to, if you regulate as a class, it's going to take care of that entire class. So I think it's a little bit of a, a false argument to say that we can't regulate the whole class because the treatment technologies actually are going to remove a full array. So the GAC um, may or may not remove certain of them. In some cases, you may need to go to reverse osmosis. And that obviously benefits public it health. It has enormous public health benefits because people won't be exposed. All right, thank you. Uh, the uh, gentleman concludes, so uh, we'll now recognize Representative Rogers for five minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I represent Fairchild Air Force Base, which is the largest tanker base in America and the largest employer in Spokane County, which in recent years has been leading some discovery efforts in our community uh, around the base to test for PFOS contamination in the water supply for the base, as well as in the neighborhoods and community around the base. And this contamination has largely been pointed to the uses of firefighting foam through the years. We all agree 
that we need to better understand the issue and the impact PFOS is having on many of us. I'd like just to, uh, Mr. Meehan, I'd like to ask about your current research efforts into PFOS and the family of chemicals. Your, your testimony notes that additional research is needed to develop analytical methods to quantify levels of PFOS compounds in environmental samples like water supplies. If science is currently unable to even detect the presence of some PFOS compounds in water supplies, how would a water system be able to determine whether the filters or any effort to treat for the compound has been effective? Well, there are a few methods for some of the PFAS uh, and more being developed by EPA, but we don't really have it for wastewater and soil. So uh, there is you know, a vast frontier of research that's needed out there. I, I was happy to see EPA just let out 3.9 million on research projects. But when I think of the, I spent eight years in Michigan working on uh, Great Lakes issues. When I think of the whole issue with chlorinated compounds and chlorine and organochlorines, that was a 20, 30 year effort. You know, and we, there are th many, many chlorinated compounds. We got down to a list of 25 and we worked that hard and got maximum risk reduction for a reasonable investment. So. Uh, I don't see, I, I, I quite frankly take issue with Eric on that we know what the, bene, you know what the benefits and the costs are, what technologies are available, what methods will tell us. Uh, again, I'll defer to Dr. DeWitt on the science. I'm a recovering lawyer, not a scientist, but uh, uh, I, I, we're, 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 we're in un unknown territory here. Well, do, do you believe it would be wise for EPA to promulgate a drinking water regulation for this family of chemicals for human biomonitoring? When you say a family, you mean the whole family of or, PFAS? Or, or this? Uh, uh, I, I don't know how they can do 5,000. Now, there is some precedent, the disinfection byproducts I mentioned, where you they have a suite of MCLs and treatment standards dealing with a bundle of them. And that was done through a very uh, collaborative federal FACA, Federal Advisory Committee process. Uh, this one, I confess, I, I don't know how you did, uh, you know, unless you just acted without information, without a risk assessment, without benefit costs, without knowing technology, how you do that whole family. I, it just defies my understanding anyway. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Steglitz, um, I wanted to ask you some about the Michigan uh, example and just a, uh, the work that was done at the state level and how that has supplemented or supplanted maybe what's going on at the federal level, either at EPA or DOD? And do you, um, how, how do you believe these state initiatives can work best with the federal level? Um, if I understand your question correctly, um, are, are you speaking about the, the testing that the, that the state has done to identify sources? Has the state uh, laid out some standards? So Michigan is in the, cur in the process of um, establishing um, recommended MCLs for um, PFAS compounds. It's unclear how many. Um, Dr. DeWitt is participating in that process. So um, by October of 2019, Michigan um, is supposed to have recommendations to the governor on um, MCLs and how these chemicals will be regulated. Okay, so there's nothing currently at the state level. It's not. Not currently. Okay. How do you see that working with efforts at the federal level? Are you working closely with EPA as you're working moving forward? Um, my understanding is that EPA um, Region 5 is, is engaged with the process, but uh, Michigan is really taking this, the leadership. Um, um, they're moving forward with this because they, of all of the testing and the analytical work that's been done in Michigan to identify um, uh, sources of, of PFAS contamination. So. Um, really not waiting for EPA moving forward on their own um, because of really the demand from the residents of Michigan. Okay, okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll yield the rest of my time. Yield back. The general lady yields back. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, identifying the different chemicals in this class and understanding the differences between them is challenging for us as lawmakers, but it is especially challenging for the affected communities. So I appreciate that the legislation before us today addresses these uh, chemicals as a class. That approach ensures that we address all of the chemicals of concern and avoid dangerous substitutions. I believe the question of whether we treat PFAS as a class will be a central question as we move forward with legislation. So I would like to hear from the panel about this approach. Uh, Mr. Olson, uh, do you think it is important uh, to treat PFAS as a class for regulatory purposes? 
it's crucial to treat them as a class um, for several reasons. One is they, this carbon fluorine bond, um, that makes them all share a lot of similar properties. Um, secondly, the more we study any of these individual compounds, the more we find they're toxic at low doses. We have a big whack-a-mole problem where if we regulate PFO and PFOS or a couple others, they just move to Gen X, and then we study Gen X, and they move to another, and we've got 4,700 of these things, and we'll never finish regulating. And finally, two major scientific statements by the Helsingor um, statement and the Madrid statement from 200 scientists say that we should regulate these as a class because of their similarities. And so the challenges that you see with trying to regulate individual PFAS one by one pretty much gets addressed by the fact that you said they can be just transferred over? That's to... right. You can, you can, that's the problem is that if you don't regulate them as a class, we simply have this whack-a-mole treadmill where mm -hmm. we never get around to really regulating things. Well, we have bills before us that touch on multiple statutes, so I'd like to make sure uh, that I understand as we go forward. Do you think PFAS should be treated as a class when we are adopting? Uh, treatment techniques to remove them from drinking water. Yes, and I think EPA could issue a treatment technique rule that would say, use this technology, it'll remove the full class. That would be, rather than setting MCLs for 4,000 or 600 or however many individual chemicals. Mm -hmm. Or what about when we're cleaning up Superfund sites? Again, I think EPA could move forward with some treatment requirements. They could have certain chemicals that are sentinel chemicals. Uh, if they're detected, then start requiring treatment. And what about when we are reporting releases under the toxics release inventory? Would identifying each individual PFAS release be challenging? Well, I think there will be some challenges. We'd like to see perhaps identifying some chemicals that would have to explicitly be disclosed and then the full class so that we have an idea of downstream sources if they know where it's coming from. But you also have captured the full class. Thank you. And given what we know about the speed at which EPA is addressing chemicals since the Lautenberg Act, what about under TASCA, whether we are requiring testing, banning new PFAS, or comprehensively regulating all PFAS? We are very concerned about how slow that will be if Congress doesn't intervene. And it was this committee, actually, on PCBs, Mr. Dingell, who led the charge to ban PCBs as a class. I think, really, we need to go forward with a class-oriented approach um, under TASCA. Okay. Any other uh, examples of of EPA doing that as a There are many okay, examples. Um, Tioxins is another example, and, and there are others where EPA has regulated classes. Mm -hmm. uh, turning to Dr. DeWitt, I understand that PFAS share important uh, chemical characteristics, so I want to understand whether they share toxicological profiles. Do you agree that these chemicals should be treated as a class? I do agree, and I think that Mr. Olson has made some very important points about the carbon-fluorine bond, which is what these compounds all have in common. This bond makes them impossible to degrade. This bond is very strong. So as far as we know, all PFAS are persistent. They're going to be in the environment. They can move into our bodies. Once they get into our bodies, they can interact with various receptors. And as I mentioned, they can affect the immune system, they can induce cancer, they can affect the endocrine system, and they can affect lipid metabolism. These are common toxicities we observe. Thank you. When this subcommittee held a hearing on PFAS in September, we heard testimony from a resident of North Carolina whose drinking water showed 26 different PFAS were present. Many uh, she could not even identify. So Ms. Marby, given how hard it can be for affected communities to identify the specific PFAS in their air and water. Is it important to you that we take action to address all PFAS rather than just a select few? It's extremely important. I mean, in my, like, when I was telling you my story, we were, we were tested in our blood for six PFAS chemicals, and we had five out of the six. So even though I told you about our PFOA blood levels, we have other chemicals. We have pH F XPA, pH FPS, like they're there, PFNA. I, as a mom, like filter it, filter the water. I mean, human health should come first. Nobody should have to experience what we've gone through. I mean, the solutions are there. Everybody just needs to come together and meet in the middle and find the common ground. It shouldn't be cost over human health. No family should go through what we went through. Nobody. My Thank children, you. my grandchildren are gonna have these chemicals, okay? My grandchildren. My daughter is going to pass these chemicals to her children, okay? 
if she decides to have a child in the next five, six years. That's and through no fault of her own. From, from, from bathing, from having a, a glass of water. You know, I was strict. Believe it or not, I was really strict. No soda, milk or water. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now I, the chair recognizes Representative McKinley uh, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you, Mr. Marple, for your, your reference back to um, uh, Parkersburg in Vienna, West Virginia. Uh, that's my district, and uh, three years ago, we spent a great deal of time trying to address this issue and figure out what, how we might be able to resolve it, and, and one of the, the resolutions there was uh, the activated carbon filters, um, and, and that worked. But it opened up, and this whole educational process that we learned three years ago uh, opened up more questions and so I may be at odds with my party, but I'm also I'm, I'm at odds with this whole issue, trying to understand it as an engineer. I'm, I'm one of just two licensed professional engineers in Congress. Uh, so I, because I, what I look at the, on this, um, one thing we learned was 80% of our exposure to PFAS is 80% of it is not water. It's from the food weed. Uh, the CDC came out with a, uh, their their report said, uh, drinking water, ingesting food uh, from fish and selfish, uh, packaged food, packaged products, hand to mouth, primarily with carpeting. So you can get that from carpeting, the the dust and the filter on, uh, with that, and just working in a plant. So we've got we've got other than just water, we should be addressing. Okay. Now with that. The Geneva, uh, they just had a conference in Geneva last two weeks ago. I like, because what I'm concerned about is imports. We can, we can take a, an action in America and deal with it. But until there's a global consciousness of this and we're importing, we're still going to have this exposure to it. And what they did in the, just two weeks ago in Geneva, they exempted all the products we're worried about. They're, they exempted... Firefighting foam, they exempted implantable medical devices, fluorinated polymers, that's our Teflon. Uh, they exempted plastic accessories for car interior parts, and they exempted manufacturing electric wires. Uh, I, I'm just saying, folks, we, we, can, we can chase this rabbit about water, but there are a lot more problems associated. There, we're not going to be addressing that especially because we're part of a global community and we're gonna be importing things that come in that are gonna be contaminated and continue to, to do this. So I, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm concerned about how we're gonna protect ourselves from being exposed in the future in other than water. So Mr. Meehan, can you explain or, or give me a little bit of guidance here on how we might address this if, the, if globally there's not a ban on Teflon well, I, I think you raise a very good point, uh, uh, and, I, and I must say, I think the general view that the committee's taken, and, and I think Eric's test, or written comments, this is a, a multimedia problem. It is a multidimensional problem. A global, comprehensive approach makes sense. I mean, looking at Superfund, Tosca, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, and, and, you know, we'll look at MCLs and things like that through the process under the Safe Drinking Water Act. So, yeah, I, uh, we certainly view ourselves uh, as at the receiving end of this problem as utilities, and certainly our customers feel the same way. So, yes, uh, I think everything should be on the table and looked at it in terms of what makes sense and is reasonable in terms of reducing risk across the whole spectrum. Yeah, they, of, uh, they even went to, uh, to China and, and, and the European Union Mm -hmm. have asked for exemptions to the whole ban. So I'm just curious, as yeah, long I, as we're going to be importing products coming in, especially food products from the uh, European Union and, and carpeting, because that's where our, our toddlers, that's where they're going to get exposed to it, I think we have, let's, I, we need to slow this train down just a little bit, do a better analysis of how we might approach this globally and, we, and push back. But apparently we lost the fight at it, Stockholm and G Geneva, and we're allowing these products to be manufactured 
and, and ship to us. Yeah, maybe we can't make it, but other people can, and they come in, and our children, your children, your grandchildren are going to be exposed to something, not because of an American manufacturer, but because of a European Union manufacturer or a Chinese manufacturer. I think we better... I, I, I'd like maybe lecture you, you explain. Is there a way that we can approach this from a global perspective? Well, uh, you're getting into issues of international environmental law and trade policy, and, how, and I certainly am not an expert in that. I know you'll hear a lot of talk from Europeans about the precautionary principle and reverse burden, and then they make exceptions. They don't have a, t a tort uh, law regime like we do. So I think we need to keep our wits about us and, and do what it takes to protect our, our environment, our public health, and our people. And uh, I think you're onto something there, looking at the international dimension of the problem. Thank you. You'll back my time. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, for five minutes. I thank the chair and the ranking member, and I thank the witnesses this morning. It's, it's, I'm sure this is a, can be a difficult hearing for you. Uh, but there is common ground to move forward on the legislation. So I want to move the, uh, to the issue of, of air emissions of PFAS. We know PFAS are being related in, in are being released into the air during manufacturing processes uh, and during some of, and some of those products uh, during their disposal. We also know that PFAS dust is an issue when contaminated sites are cleaned up. Last September, we heard from a resident of North Carolina who testified that her community uh, was finding PFAS in rainwater 80 miles away from the factory that was producing the chemicals. Uh, last month, I questioned the EPA Administrator Wheeler about finding, about funding that research uh, and ensuing uh, we address PFAS air emissions. Administrator Wheeler did not want to commit on those emissions. Dr. DeWitt, what are the risks pr presented by air emissions of PFAS? I, I think you've hit upon a, a point where we really do need some additional information, but I think if we look at how these compounds move around in the environment, and if we look at people's exposure levels to compounds that shouldn't be in the environment, then we can start to make some, some guesses about how these compounds impact us when we take them up, either through the skin or through inhalation. For example, in Parkersburg, West Virginia, the boundary of PFOA has not been discovered from this point source into water. So we know that these compounds can move very far away from points of origin. They could even move in from other countries. We do have some very uh, proactive organizations within our country and within the European Union working to reduce these compounds at the source. There are manufacturers within the US. Um, IKEA in, the, in Europe are working very hard to do source reduction, which will help to reduce all sources of PFOA PFAS exposure through their own incentives to help consumers make appropriate choices. Good. Uh, Mrs. Marp, for a community like yours, you're doing everything you can to get PFAS out of the drink water. How does PFAS and air pollution complicate that? Air pollution is one of the reasons I moved and I sold my house um, to get away from the smokestacks. I mean, it's so ambiguous and it's everywhere. So I, I find it very hard to believe that I'll be able to protect my children un unless they're on filtered water. And that's why we chose to move, move to Hoosick Falls. A lot of people ask me, why did you pick there? Why would you go somewhere where the problem was worse? Well, first of all, my house in Petersburg was worse than the whole village's supply. But I went there because I didn't have to have the polluter coming into my space and violating my, my home. I mean, that's the main reason I moved. Our safety is security. We were tied, I was literally tied to the polluter. Every three months they had to come into my home, sample my water, you know, to, so, to protect my kids from the water. Is so, I mean, you have tools for protecting you from the water, but the air, you basically had to sell your house. It's everywhere. What are, what are, what are we going to do? I, we can't filter our, our entire earth. I mean, you have it in polar bears. <laughs> yeah. It's in their blood. The national average is two. You probably have two parts per billion in your blood. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, there are strong arguments in favor of H.R. 2605 introduced by Representative Stevens to list PFAS as a hazardous air pollution under the Clean Air Act. Um, Mr. Olson, how would adding PFAS to the hazardous air pollution list help communities, public health, and the environment? Well, it's crucial to address all the media that we're exposed to. You just heard a personal story um, 
from Emily about um, being exposed. There are a lot of people that are downwind of facilities that are releasing PFAS that have no idea they're being exposed. We really do need to list PFAS as hazardous air pollutants so that we can ensure that there'll be controls. Well, the Clean Air Act has 187 hazardous air pollutants on its list. 17 lists are in the group of chemicals like mercury compounds and polycyclic organic matter. Why should PFAS be included as a group on the HAP list? Well, I think for exactly the reason we've just heard, that they're very toxic at very low doses. They are extremely persistent. They're forever chemicals, and they're quite mobile. They move well beyond where that stack is emitting it. They're going to move down uh, wind um, for many miles. So we really need, from a public health standpoint, to ensure that people are protected from those emissions. And think about the incinerators as well that are not really regulated. Exactly. Um, if they're incinerating this waste um, at low temperatures, that stuff is just going up in the air and we're moving it from one media to mm -hmm. another one. So we need hazardous air pollutant um, rules for them. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. We now move to those who have waved on to the subcommittee. We appreciate your interest. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Well, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate uh, being allowed to, to, to sit on this uh, subcommittee that I'm not normally a member of, and appreciate your leadership at Mr. Shimkus's and the, and the hardworking staff as well. So 10 months ago, uh, the city of Parchment in my district uh, awoke to a startling new reality. They found extremely high levels of PFO and PFOS, not only at a capped landfill, but the chemicals were also discovered in their drinking water at levels many times above EPA's lifetime health advisory. And while Parchment was the first community to have its water test results come in that high, it was not the only place where PFOS chemicals were found in the drinking water in Michigan, as we've learned. Now, literally every community and regardless of size, in terms of their municipal water supply, was tested uh, across the state at the governor's orders uh, and uh, uh, to try and assure that the, the water quality was, was safe in, in, the, in their proper areas. But some of the smartest minds working on PFAS contamination are in Michigan, not because of its water, but be, not because of what's in the water, but because of our water. And I'm fortunate that one of the premier scientists on PFAS, Dr. Matt Reeves, is based in my district at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, and we have easy access to his work. He recently published a white paper outlining a national roadmap for addressing PFAS, and I want to submit not his report, but rather his findings as, as part of uh, the record. The white paper itself calls for the development of a research consortium with the express purpose of addressing many of the critical research areas using best science practices, state-of-the-art technology, and high-impact dissemination of research findings and challenges. Uh, now, I also know that our committee, full committee, is going to be one of those that it's going to be relied upon for developing infrastructure legislation, uh, likely to move, I think, in the, in the next couple of months. And I'd like to think that perhaps one of those provisions, part of that package, would include some of these bills uh, that we are working on that were addressed, uh, and I intend to co-sponsor a number of them uh, as we work on this issue uh, to try and get an answer uh, for our citizens that really do understand where we are and, and want some action taken. Ms. Luxton, uh, I introduced a bill this last week, H.R. 2626, bipartisan legislation, that will give EPA a year to decide whether to list well-characterized PFAS as a hazardous substance under CERCLA Section 102A. What are your thoughts about qualifying PFAS substances within the term well-characterized uh, for EPA to prioritize which contaminants should be reviewed for their potential to present a substantial danger? 
Thank you. Um, that, I think, is a constructive suggestion. Uh, the one area of risk I would suggest is that it's a new term, not defined. So um, as someone who has seen a fair amount of administrative law litigation, I would recommend uh, providing a definition or some criteria so that it's clear what that term means and avoids delays that could be caused by ambiguities in wording and subsequent litigation. But the idea of trying to focus on those that are well characterized or about which enough is known to make a judgment on toxicity and other factors is really a very constructive idea and allows for prioritization of resources, which I think is a very important outcome in what legislation is adopted. Thank you. And as you know, as we've struggled with PFAS contamination clean, uh, cleanups, including state standards that a number of states may pursue, including Michigan, do you think uh, cooperative agreements between the federal and state governments provide a reasonable path forward to achieve protective dam cleanups that meet the guidelines of both governmental en entities? Yes, I, th I absolutely think that is another constructive approach, as are these consortia that we've been hearing about today among academics and to share the resources. There's so much ground to cover that any ways we can um, support to cooperate on federal and state uh, um, capabilities and share resources as well as the academic knowledge we are learning in this frontier, as one of the witnesses said, is very important. Just in closing, because my time has expired, and I, I just, uh, I know a number of us have met with EPA over the last a number of weeks and months. Uh, they need to be part of this process as well. They need to be, and I believe that they are brought in. We need to continue to make sure that it's bipartisan and work with our committee to get some legislative action with that. Mr. Chairman, I yield back and thank you again. The gentleman yields back, yeah, and we will um, visit your request to enter yeah, I'm going to introduce the, record. the findings, not, not the white paper itself. Yeah. And we'll do that at the end of the hearing. So Great. Thank you. So we thank you again. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we've heard calls from industry to wait to act on PFAS um, to, to let TOSCA, uh, the TOSCA process, um, take its course and let EPA set reference um, and, and let EPA set uh, reference doses for each PFAS chemical one by one. But even when uh, we, we first passed TSCA um, back in 1976, Congress recognized that the statute might not work for some classes of chemicals. And that's why PCBs were dealt with um, comprehensively, quickly, and as a class through a separate TSCA subsection. It was uh, John Dingell's wisdom um, that led to the adoption of the uh, PCP, PCB uh, subsection, and it stands now as one of the only actions EPA was able to take under the original TSCA. So I welcome H.R. 2600, introduced by Representative Dean, which takes the same approach for PFAS chemicals. I wanted to ask Dr. DeWitt, um, do PFAS, uh, PFASs uh, present some of the same concerns as PCBs in terms of how long they remain in the environment and some of the risks that they, uh, that they pose. And let me just go on and say, do you think additional PFAS as, as well um, uh, can, be, can be handled in that same way as that PCBs were? Yes, I, I do think that PFAS can be handled similarly to PCBs. I would also like to point out that PFAS are, in a sense, very different from PCBs. PCBs like to be in fat. They like to be in sediment. They don't move around, and eventually they do break down. PFAS are happy being in water. They're happy being in soil. They're happy being in fat, and they are very mobile, and they don't break down. It's estimated that DDT, a very of an organochlorine pesticide, takes about 30 years to break down into more toxic compounds. Uh, we don't know yet if PFAS will take longer than that, but we suspect that they will. So they're different from PCBs in and that worse. they're 
and, and worse, and the suite of effects that they produce seems to be broader than the suite of effects produced by PCBs. So um, what do you think of then, um, of the assertion drawing from our experience uh, addressing PCBs? You're thinking we should handle it the same way, I take it. I think it would be a very wise move to deal with a class of compounds that is persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic, and mobile. Um, Mr. Olson, you noted in your testimony that we still, uh, we can still de detect PCBs in the environment dis despite the strong statutory language adopted in 1976. Why is that? Well, they're extremely persistent, um, like PFAS. Um, so they last in the environment a long time, as Dr. DeWitt just mentioned. Um, and we're very concerned um, that they are much more mobile than PCBs, it appears. Um, and they are these forever chemicals. And they are toxic at extremely low doses, just a terrible combination. Thank you. Um, Mr. Steglitz, um, are PCP, PCBs still a challenge for water systems like yours? Um, that hasn't been something that we've had to deal with in our watershed. Thank you. Um, it has been more than 40 years since Congress added PCBs, but we are still cleaning them up. It seems likely that if we take action today to regulate um, PFAS, uh, uh, we will be cleaning them up for generations. So again, Mr. Um, Mr. Olson, given that, it seems uh, to it seems to seems to me um, like we should get started right away. Do you agree? I, I would agree. I think we need to get started right away. We are now everyone in this room guinea pigs. We are carrying these chemicals around in our bodies, and we didn't agree to carry them around in our bodies yet we are being exposed to them every day. Our kids are being exposed to them. Our grandchildren will be exposed to them. We need to get started now on doing something. Regardless, will they be there hanging around for a while? They will be around for decades. Thank you. I yield back. The uh, general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for five thank minutes. You, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I want to echo some of the concerns that my colleagues have already expressed today. These. These are really important issues, very important issues, and we need to continue to work hard to make sure we're doing everything we can do to address PFAS concerns correctly and appropriately. Many states are dealing with contamination issues. I know my home state of Ohio is, uh, and we need to ensure our states and regulated community are receiving the scientific support uh, and signals from the federal government. That's why I am concerned that the EPA is not in the room today to provide the necessary technical and scientific insight on the bills that we're discussing, especially as some of these bills were just recently introduced. So let me focus on, on, on some of the bills dealing with TSCA. And uh, Ms. Luxton, I'd appreciate your thoughts on these. H.R. Uh, 2608 requires uh, EPA to compel by order comprehensive new lines of testing on all PFAS substances. It also waives requirements on the EPA to create a statement of need for the tests or to rely on lesser test methods to rule out the need to show toxicity. With so many chemicals under the PFAS umbrella, about 5,000 or so, is there concern that the EPA could unintentionally focus its time and effort on low-risk chemicals instead of prioritizing high-risk chemicals? Yes, I think that's a very good question and a very real risk. Um, EPA has identified in its priority list of top concerns that it wants to spend uh, its greatest attention on. Um, three of the five include addressing existing Superfund sites and trying to accelerate the cleanups of those Superfund sites. We're talking now about expanding that set of, of sites. Um, and then fulfilling its requirements under TSCA, under the most recent amendments, to go through those chemicals that have already been identified as of high toxicity. So again, uh, the third is reducing non-attainment areas for air pollution, existing air pollution. These are other priorities that already exist for EPA to fulfill adding to those indiscriminately, that is to say without looking at this in a priority risk way, 
will it, it risks overwhelming the system and uh, suppressing or, or, or reducing the ability to deal with a collection of, of risks that affect the American population in many ways. Okay. All right. Um, another bill on new chemicals, H.R. 2596, would prevent any new chemicals that are PFAS uh, from being commercially manufactured, imported, or processed. Do you think it would be a bit more reasonable for the EPA to use a tiered approach that would limit the amount of data that is required to collect if there isn't a toxicity problem evident with one of the PFAS chemicals? Yes, I think tiering is a very good approach. Um, looking at the types of, of PFAS chemicals, trying to group them in terms of toxicity, the short chain, long chain issue, there are differences among these compounds that really can make a difference in terms of toxicity, uptake, uh, and health effects. Okay. Um, uh, Ms. Luxton, you, you mentioned that legislation that mandates action by a federal department or agency like the bills we have before us today can have blind spots to the requirements of the Administrative Procedure Act. In looking at these bills as it relates to Administrative Procedure, uh, the per Administrative Procedure Act, do you think items like notice and comment are in danger of being minimized or ignored? Yes, whenever there are bills that try to expedite um, rulemaking and cut corners, um, those procedures that were adopted and are well embedded in the law create litigation uh, opportunities, which can have the effect of delaying the effectiveness of new legislation all by itself because it's tied up in the courts for years. I, you may have just answered this, but let me clarify. Would you be concerned that short-circuiting these requirements make the objectives of these bills subject to successful judicial challenge? Yes, we've seen that happen. And what happens when uh, regulations are litigated over uh, uh, process considerations? Delay. And if the rule is invalidated, the agency has to start all over from scratch and put together a new rule that can stand up in court. Wasted time, right? Wasted time. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Soto, for five minutes, please. Thank you, Chairman. When I had uh, first heard of the chemicals related to PFAS and uh, PFAS, much like, mu like many in the public, it was through tragedy um, because these are chemicals that many of us in the public were unaware of. And in, in this case, it was our firefighter training school in Ocala, Florida, uh, where we had a cancer cluster uh, happen. And uh, it is to such an extent that the VP of the National Firefighters Union, uh, his brother, was one of those victims. So I, th I think as we're talking about all the technicalities today, we need to really consider um, how this is affecting the American public on a, on a broader scale than things like rulemaking and whether Congress should act you know, a, a congressional law is absolutely under separation of powers, uh, takes precedence over any rulemaking of an agency. It's clear from everything we are hearing today that we need to attack the PFAS contamination from every angle. And we should be working to stop the flow of chemicals into our environment, into our bodies. But government action can be slow. Hearing from my constituents, they want us to act. Um, Mr. Olson, what are some of the everyday products people might use that would contain PFAS? Thank you for the question, Mr. Soto, and thank you for your bill um, that would address at least the cookware issue. Um, uh, there are innumerable um, products that contain um, PFAS. They range from the carpeting that our children may be crawling on or walking on. They include a wide array of clothing. They include textiles. They are sprayed on some of the furniture that we use. They are used in just a wide array of, of uh, consumer products. And we'd like to actually see your terrific bill that would um, include an EPA program to make sure that consumers can make an intelligent choice, um, even expanded to some other consumer products. How would they be able to make informed choices right now uh, with regard to PFAS exposure? Basically, they can't. Um, if you go into a local store, you'll see 
uh, cookware, for example, often labeled PFOA free. Well, that doesn't tell you anything of value because they may have just switched over to a different PFAS. So it's very misleading to consumers in some cases if they're continuing to use toxic PFAS um, and just labeling it PFOA free. So let's say we implement the Safer Choice program through the legislation that we introduced. How would that influence companies uh, as far as new products they put out on the market? Well, I think what we've seen in other cases is when consumers know they can make a choice, um, if I go in and I have my choice between a PFAS-free cookware or carpet or couch, and I can buy one that, does, that uh, doesn't have that versus one that does, I'm going to make the choice. And right now, consumers don't have that information. We heard a lot of testimony today about uh, addressing all PFAS and not just p focusing on PFOA and PFOS. Uh, would the label requirement under our bill have the same value if it only co covered PFOA or PFOS? No, for exactly the reasons we were just talking about, because um, we know that uh, even some folks are now labeling them as PFOA-free or PFOS-free. Um, we need to deal with the whole class. Ms. Marp, I was really obviously taken aback by your personal story uh, and what you and your family went through. On behalf of moms across America, what would be the cost of inaction if we, if we do nothing here? The cost of, the cost of inaction has already been extraordinary. Um, I mean, I talked to Tova McNaughton from Michigan um, about her, her, her son Jack. You know, he tested at over 400 parts per billion in his blood, the highest child I know of. Um, that, that's such a tough question because it's everywhere. Like as much as I wanted to protect my family, I still know. I know where it is. Like I've educated myself. I've killed myself to educate myself. You know, New York State did not educate me. And do you think there's a lot of families still living unaware of this danger? Absolutely. You, you have to remember, Petersburg, well, you wouldn't have to remember because you don't know, but <laughs> Petersburg. Our chairman would know. <laughs> yeah. Our, 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 the town of Petersburg only has 76 wells on the municipal supply. 76 wells. So, the, like, before, it, you had to have a population above 10,000. Okay? Now it's 3,500. Okay, that still doesn't save the little towns of Petersburg. And the, these companies set up shop in rural communities where they fly under the radar. I mean, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it. You have no idea it's there until somebody tells you. If Michael Hickey never tested the water, we still wouldn't know. He took his own money, his own personal money, to test the water because his father died of kidney cancer. He was smart enough to think, hey, can Teflon cause cancer? His father worked for the plant in Hoosick Falls for 32 years. He came home. His home was literally 800 feet from the plant. 800 feet. The man showered in it, cooked in it, drank it. I mean, and he's gone. He died shortly after retirement. You can't make this up. I mean, it's already taken decades. You're like 50, 60 years too late. This should have been stopped in the 50s when it was created. It is a man-made chemical. It doesn't belong in me. It doesn't belong in my children. It doesn't belong in you. It's there. Go test yourself. Feel free. It's like 500 bucks. Gentleman yields back. Uh, we now recognize the gentleman from the state of New Mexico, Mr. Lujan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and <clears throat> thank you to Ranking Member Shimkus as well for allowing me to join this hearing and Mark, thank you for your testimony and your responses as well. Thank you to each of the witnesses for sharing your expertise as well with the urgency of having to respond to this environmental and health crisis that we're facing across the country. We are just now beginning to see all of the dimensions of this crisis and Mr. Olson in your testimony you made clear that these are forever chemicals that don't break down and can enter our food and water and systems in many different ways. Ms. Marp, you just reminded us of that. In my district, the Department of Defense's use of the PFAS-laden 
firefighting foams has polluted the groundwater needed by adjacent dairy farmers to grow their crops and water their cows. The Department of Defense refuses to clean up the groundwater. Think about what I just said. The Department of Defense refuses to clean up this groundwater, even though they fully acknowledge that their actions created this pollution. That's why many pieces of this legislation are required. Along with Senator Udall, I recently introduced the Prompt and Fast Action to Stop Damages Act of 2019 to force the Department of Defense to do what is right, to do what they should have been doing all along and cleaning up the mess that they created, make the impact of dairy farmers whole. Mr. Olson, I appreciate your discussion and support of my legislation in your written testimony. Can you elaborate on why it's critical for the Department of Defense to clean up all sources of PFAS contamination? Well, I think a lot of us learned in kindergarten that if you make a mess, you clean it up. Robert Fulgram is one of my favorite uh, authors. Exactly. And unfortunately, it seems maybe Department of Defense didn't learn that in kindergarten, mm -hmm. and a lot of polluters did not. It's very important for those that have created a mess and created risks and poisoned their community to be responsible for cleaning up. And that's why it's important to hold those polluters accountable, whether they're federal agencies or they're private companies. I want to ask you another question that points to several pieces of legislation that have been authored. Should the Department of Defense be required to clean up water sources used to produce our food and milk, just like they're required to clean up our drinking water? They absolutely should. In fact, last night I met um, one of your constituents, a farmer whose um, milk is contaminated. He's having to destroy his milk every day. He's probably going to have to destroy his dairy cows, um, and they aren't going to be able to sold, be sold as food. Um, because they're so contaminated. So we definitely need to make sure we're protecting agricultural uses of that water as well. And rather than acquiring that farm, purchasing those dairy cattle, and cleaning up their mess, the Department of Defense is paying to buy the milk. It's millions it's, of dollars. I mean, like, it, it doesn't make any sense when it's less expensive to fix the problem, to clean up their own mess. But again, that's why if the Department of Defense is saying that they don't have the authority, which I disagree with. Mm -hmm. This legislation that is before this subcommittee, before other committees or jurisdiction, will require them to do this. And so I appreciate your testimony there, Mr. Olson. Just in closing, I want to emphasize that the emotional and financial hardships, much of which that has been shared today, other testimony that has been shared through conversations from constituents that have traveled from across America to be here in Washington, D.C. this week, I want to encourage our members to make sure that they're having town halls in these communities, that they're making themselves available, that they're listening to the constituents so that way we can share those stories and show the urgency of needing to act across America. That includes the farming community in Curry County, community that I'm honored to represent. Since the Department of Defense is neglecting its responsibility to clean up the groundwater, the burden has fallen entirely on the dairy farmers. They're having to put in their own filters, put in their own work plan for their own futures. Department of Defense needs to do the right thing here. Farms have either stopped producing milk because they don't have access to clean water or at their own ex expense installed filtration systems costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mr. Chairman, they should be reimbursed for that by the Department of Defense. They're doing their work for them. While the farming community's very way of life is being threatened and the Department of Defense is just standing there, doing nothing. These farmers are running out of time, and it's up to Congress to act. And for the sake of the farmers in my district and the families across the country, we need to act now and act quickly. And I thank the chairman and the ranking member for their indulgence and thank them for letting me sit in this important committee hearing today. The uh, gentleman yields back, and uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from the state of California, uh, Ms. Matsui, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. Um, we've seen that many private companies are moving away from PFOA and PFOS for shorter chain substitutes. While I think we can all agree that this is a good step in acknowledging that the known risks that PFOA and PFOS pose, I'm concerned that the amount of research and 
information on some of these substitutes. For example, over the past couple of years, we've been hearing numerous reports of high levels of the chemical Gen X being used by companies like Chemours. However, EPA issued a draft toxic, toxic, toxicity review last fall of two chemicals, Gen X and a related compound, PFBS, that demonstrated even very low doses was still, could still present ser serious health risks, such as issues with prenatal development and immune system, liver, kidney, or thyroid complications. Dr. DeWitt, I think you are acutely aware of the issue, which has been a particular problem in your state of North Carolina. At this point, what do we know about the health risks of some of these short and intermediate chain substitutes? They are just as persistent as the long chain compounds. They are able to move from the environment into bodies, just like the long chain compounds. And once in their bodies, they're able to interact with molecules in our bodies to produce toxicity. You mentioned immunotoxicity, which we see with Gen X. We still see increases in liver weight and increases in liver enzymes, which are a sign of toxicity. So we see many of the same types of effects as the long chains. Okay. Mr. Olson, in your view, do we have enough information about the risks posed by PFAS, PFAS as a class to begin taking action now? Absolutely, we do. And if we don't regulate them as a class, we're going to be on this treadmill of trying to regulate one at a time and we'll never get off of it. Okay. All of us are aware here that uh, PFAS is known as forever chemicals because they don't readily or easily decompose or degrade forever in our environment and forever in our bodies, and that's really a troubling thought. Dr. DeWitt, I'd like to ask you for more information about the health risks for vulnerable populations like pregnant women and children. What do we know about how PFAS impacts, a, how it impacts a developing infant or child? In infants and in developing organisms, infants and children consume a higher amount of water per body weight than adults, so their relative exposure is greater. They also have relatively poorly developed systems for metabolizing, even though these aren't metabolizing, and excreting compounds, so their body burden retain remains a little bit higher, so th these compounds stay in their bodies a little bit longer. And because many of their other systems aren't fully developed, they're more sensitive to the effects of these compounds. We also know that these compounds can be excreted in breast milk, so they're getting exposures through breast milk, and if they if they are families that live in contaminated communities who choose not to breastfeed, they will get exposed through their contaminated drinking water and other items in the home that may contain PFAS. Okay, so based upon what you know about the health effects of these chemicals, do you think it's appropriate to treat them as a class? I agree that that's appropriate. I think it's a wise decision. Okay, these chemicals are dangerous and extraordinarily persistent, and we could be dealing with this for generations, we have to make a difference. Do you perceive an additional risk due to the fact that DOD is only looking at these two specific chemicals rather than the entire class of PFAS chemicals? I think that looking at the chemicals as a class is an important consideration because they have all been designed to have similar functionality, so their physical chemical properties are very similar. The carbon fluorine bond does not break down, and as you mentioned, they're forever in our environments and forever in our bodies. Well, I do hope we take some action right now. I yield back. Thank you. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the very patient uh, general lady from uh, New Hampshire, Representative Custer, you're recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you very much, Chairman Tonko, and I want to thank you and uh, Ranking Member Shimkus for allowing me to sit in on this hearing. This is not my normal subcommittee, but it's an important issue, not only in my district, but across the country. I, I want to first take a moment to thank uh, Emily for being with us as a mother and a she-bear. I know how this feels, and um, but I can't even begin to imagine the fear that you felt. And um, I'm glad that you were able to take the steps to sell your home because there are families all across this country that can't move. They don't have that opportunity. They can't find someone to buy the home that they've invested in. And um, in, in my district, we're going through this in a, a small town called Litchfield, New Hampshire. Uh, contamination from the St. Gobins Plastic Company um, was found in, in water testing, uh, coming through the air, getting into the soil. Um, fortunately, we were able to, because of advocates like yourself, the, the people living in this community, 
um, brought it to our attention, brought it to their board of selectmen. We were able to bring the company in and we were able to get the attention of the EPA and um, the state of New Hampshire and St. Gobans reached a monumental agreement that required the manufacturer to run clean water to all of the affected homes. Um, some of these homes have been hooked up to a neighboring city of Manchester to get water to the door. Um, but I am concerned, as the parents are, about children playing in the yard, about what's coming through the air, about um, what what is affecting them. In a neighboring town, also in my district, Amherst, New Hampshire, 2016, New Hampshire Department of uh, environmental services tested 11 wells within a one mile radius of the former location of Textiles Coated International and again found very high levels. So um, this is something that we are dealing with in New Hampshire and I just want to really acknowledge your courage because we need to put a face on this. I've studied um, way back to the first Earth Day. I can remember picking up trash and studying uh, environmental studies in, in college and just putting a face on this and being able to tell the story is important. Um, I'm just going to turn briefly to my bill, H.R. 2596, Protecting Communities from New PFAS Act, which would halt new PFAS chemicals, including, as my colleague mentioned, the short chain PFAS, from being approved through the EPA's pre manufacture notice system. And I want to um, asked Mr. Stieglitz, uh, from your testimony, you talked about, quote, the best way to address these con contaminants is at the source. Do we need to halt the approval of new PFAS chemicals from entering the commercial supply chain? And absolutely, if we can um, figure out what the health impacts are before they enter circulation, then that will be the best practice. because. Addressing it at the end of the pipe is clearly not in the, the most, not the most cost-effective way to address. Right, it. you've talked about the expense to the taxpayers, and uh, I think we need to go upstream, if you will, in the chain from that. Uh, Mr. Olson, your testimony also highlighted the importance of quote turning off the tap for the approval of new PFAS and new uses for existing PFAS. While we know that tackling this problem will take a multifaceted, comprehensive approach, we've heard so many good ideas today in this hearing, how important is it to stop new PFAS chemicals from entering the supply chain? It's absolutely critical. Um, we've already got 4,700 of these things um, or more. And adding new ones, as I say in my testimony, it's sort of like Will Rogers said, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. And we're still digging. We're still approving new uses. We're still approving um, new PFAS chemicals. And we need to stop and take a step back. And we're pleased that your bill would do that. And, and what steps do you think that Congress can take to put an end to new PFAS chemicals from being introduced? Well, I think um, this requirement of having EPA halt the new approvals. And there's a, a companion bill also that would phase out the existing uses. We think that's important. And Mr. McKinley was asking about um, imports. So it's also important that if you act under TSCA, you can also ban the imports of these products, which is very important as well. Because right now, PFO and PFOS even are allowed to be manufactured overseas, and we can get products coming into the US with them. Well, I hope that we will uh, continue to work in a bipartisan way. And um, uh, Attorney Luxon, you used the phrase, quote, our highest priority concern. I can say for myself as a legislator and a mother that my highest priority concern is the health and well-being of my constituents. And again, thank you, Emily, for bringing your story forward. With that, I yield back. General Lady yields back. And again, thank you for your patience, Representative Custer. Um, and I do thank each and every witness that appeared today. Uh, it is so important that we uh, review these issues uh, with every bit of information. Um, I remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days by which to submit additional questions for the record uh, to be answered by our witnesses. I ask each witness to respond, please, promptly to any such questions that you may receive. We've had uh, requests, uh, several requests for documents to be entered into the record. They include a letter from the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies, a letter from Westfield residents advocating for themselves uh, under the acronym of REST, a letter from the INFORM Public Project, 
a letter from the United States Chamber of Commerce, a letter from the American Chemistry Council, a fact sheet issued by the PFAS Community Campaign, uh, research findings from Dr. Matt Reeves of Western Michigan University, and then written testimony from both representatives Brian Fitzpatrick and Dan Kildee. So I would ask you, I re request unanimous consent to enter the following um, into the record. Mr. Chairman, reserving the right to object, but I will not object. Um, I, I want to, hopefully we're going to be careful on receiving testimony from people we didn't ask to testify. Uh, both Fitzpatrick and Kelly are great friends of ours. They do have relevant legislation. I, I'm not objecting to the submission, but I, I want us to be careful about a precedent we may set. We'll get all these testimonies on people who may not be as actively involved in bills in the future. So with that, I will not object. Mr. Okay, so um, the, the following will be introduced into the record. And then uh, at this time, I uh, indicate that the subcommittee is adjourned. Perfect. Good to see you, Brian. Thank you for coming. <clears throat>